Welcome to Inside Outside Innovation, episode 43. Today's interview is with Ash Moria, the author of Running Lean and his new book, Scaling Lean. With decades of experience as an entrepreneur and almost 10 years as a lean coach, Ash talked about the product design mistake that almost all innovators make and where he tells those innovators to go with their failed product and what to do with it. Ash also gave an outline of how his new book adds to the ongoing innovation conversation by giving practical tips and exercises for designing value metrics that really let you know how your business is doing and where it's going. We've got a way for you to join the conversation too, and it's not through iTunes or Twitter. You can talk to us in person at the first Inside Outside Innovation Summit happening June 19th through the 21st in Lincoln, Nebraska. Corporations, startups, partnerships, award-winning speakers, a $100,000 pitch contest, plus other prizes, and Midwestern hospitality. If you haven't already, go listen to our special announcement episode or go to theiosummit.com to find out everything you need to know and grab your ticket. So a lot of people, if you've done anything in the lean startup movement, you probably come across your your uh, stuff, whether it's uh, your books or the lean canvas or whatever. So for the audience members that may not be as familiar with uh, what you've kind of created over the last decade or so, give us a little bit of background on how you got involved in lean startup and, and some of the things that you've learned over the course of the last five, six years. I started off, I was an entrepreneur, been working in lots of products, both at small, large companies, you know, done the gamut of, of different products. Along the way, I, I uh, began to recognize a pattern that all of our ideas, whether it was mine or the founders in the companies I worked with or for, all had great, awesome ideas, but they didn't all become awesome business models. They didn't become awesome products. And I became fascinated with the process of, you know, why do we go astray? And around that time, well, a few years, I would say, into that, uh, uh, kind of 2008, 2009, um, I began to run into some of the early works that Steve Blank and Eric Reese were putting out on the Lean Startup, and a lot of the messages that they were kind of saying on why products fail seemed to resonate very strongly because I had seen that, I had kind of fallen into those same traps and had been trying to find better ways. And so I joined in on the conversation, and that's how I got sucked in. So a lot of my writing, if if some of your audience has come across it, will quickly notice that it's very much grounded in firsthand learning. Um, I, my initial blog was called Practice Trump's Theory because I believe that you really learn by doing, not just coming up with theory or, or kind of reading a bunch of stuff and not applying it. That's kind of how I got started. As to what I've learned, um, one of the things I talk about more recently is I've seen this pattern emerge um, everywhere I've gone. And the pattern is, that the reason many of these products fail is not really a failure of execution. It's not really a failure of building the thing we set out to build, but rather knowing what to build. Um, So simply we end up building the wrong product and then there's lots of kind of whys on why that happens. And that's really what I now write about. And a lot of the tools that we build are really about avoiding some of those pitfalls and biases that we we all as innovators fall into. Take me back to the early stages. Like, what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen? You know, it seems like at the early stages, uh, a lot of it was really theoretical. And it's like, let's throw some things and see what actually happens and see what uh, happens when we run some experiments or we do something like that. So what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen, uh, not only from the theoretical perspective, but from the practical side, uh, when people are start implementing this Lean Startup methodology? Sure. So I would say the, the, the biggest mind shift in the beginning, um, and this is one of Coach Steve Blank, is really this mantra of getting outside the building. Right. So up until then, we were all building products. We, had, we thought it had to be finished and perfected before we launched. And unfortunately, that's when the real learning begins. And so all that time could have been better spent if we had gotten out of the building sooner. Um, Eric Ries kind of added on top of that and said, don't just get outside the building. Think of the MVP, the minimum viable product or build that out so you can show it to customers and measure that. And I would say my contribution was uh, in the, from the running lean book was even before you build the minimum viable product, at least create a lean canvas, at least think about where you're going, think about the business model story, uh, then think about, you know, what that 
story, how that story might unfold, what the cost, who the customer is, what the problems are, how does your solution fit in their world, and then get outside the building and validate all that before you get too far in the build process. Now, since then, I found that there's even more <laughs> that should be done because I've, I've made the mistake a few times. I, I look at it as, mis I call it a mistake, but in retrospect, it's still a lot faster than the status quo of building first. But right. as your question was, you know, how are things improved? And I think we can, we can, we can improve even further. And that is that in the, in the newer book, Scaling Lean, one of the, the uh, epiphanies there was that we oftentimes can get stuck in, in the process of running experiments and the process of getting outside the building and talking to a lot of customers. And we start to get these early signals because we are going after early adopters and we get you know, early signals that we should go forward. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes we'll spend weeks doing that and then come back. And then only when we build the product do we realize that maybe the market wasn't quite as big, big as we thought. And so right. this would be the stakeholder type of questioning, which is, you know, it's great that you got 10 people say they'll buy your product, but you know, how does that scale up to the millions or billions that we are, we are trying to achieve here in, in years? And so I find that it, it is helpful to think about those things up front. And so in the newer work, I find that we can be a lot more disciplined on the output. And the way I sometimes describe that is simply running experiments is not a measure of progress. If, I, if some of your audience come from the agile world, Right. I sometimes spin that as saying, you know, simply building products, simply measuring build velocity is not enough because if you're building something nobody wants, all you prove is you build something on time and on budget. Similarly, in the lean context, similarly getting outside the building and talking to customers often not enough. If you can turn those into a working business model and start to show some of those traction metrics that we often talk about, then that also is not progress. That is spinning wheels. And so in more, in more of my recent work, I started talking about what are some of those key metrics one should be measuring and how can we even start to build some kind of a model where we can predict uh, where we are going and then measure ourselves against that. So let's unpack that a little bit because uh, there, I think that is the next level of intricacy that people run into. It's like uh, they kind of get buy off from their boss or from the investors like, hey, we're going to go and use this particular approach. We're going to run experiments. We're going to be lean. We're going to... Uh, get out uh, to the marketplace uh, with as, as minimal amount we can just to see if there's something there. But then you get into the point where how do you actually start measuring this? And you can't use your typical ROI measurements and that. So talk a little bit about the measurement and accountability and how that uh, innovation and accounting and that is uh, coming into play uh, with your methodology. Sure. So yeah, so, so you're, you're right on that. Just using typical measures of ROI are not going to work because everything is is negative or near negative in the beginning. Um, so what we need to instead do is find what might predict future revenue, future profit. And the only thing that predicts those things are customer behaviors. In the book, I offer a definition of traction as the rate at which we capture monetizable value from customers. Um, so that's the, the last part is key is that we have to be measuring customer behaviors because the behaviors they do today are what serve as predictors of future revenue in the uh, you know down the road the other piece of that is when i use the word monetizable value i'm not always talking about revenue in some instances the distance between monetizable and value and revenue is close but it's really behaviors that customers do that lead to that um, so i talk about some stories in the book um, i use two examples i use more but i'll give two here so starbucks when they were uh, rebranding the company quickly saw a pattern that time spent in store, people coming in and meeting and using it as a meeting space and, and working and, and, and doing all that within Starbucks correlated very strongly with more money being spent. And so it was not, they were not sitting around the table saying, how do we chase the money? How do we make more money? They actually doubled down on the fact that by making Starbucks comfortable, by launching campaigns where they would invite people to come and spend time in the store, the money would take care of itself. So in that instance, the time spent in store becomes an example of that monetizable value that they doubled down on and did very well. So that's uh, the metric they were kind of measuring is that, that the amount of dwell time by their customers or things correct. like that? 
Right. Correct. Exactly. Um, and that's where, you know, you, you go to a Starbucks store and if, if you remember from when they first opened, the bathrooms used to be locked, the sofas were not as comfortable, there was not pretty artwork on the walls. The, the experience and the ambience has changed and been upgraded significantly because there's positive ROI in doing that. Very simple uh, kind of alter, you know, alternate business model metric w- would be from, say, a Facebook story. So there too, there is a business model story where there are users who use the product like you and I. Uh, we don't pay Facebook, but we do because there's no such thing as a free user. Uh, so Facebook collects from us data, they collect from us our attention, and they monetize that on the secondary market. So I use the term derivative assets. So we are all derivative assets on their, on their books. And so in their world, monetizable value is really the time we are spending on their side. So monthly active users, daily active users, is that metric. And if that number is going up and to the right, that asset is growing. Uh, they have one other number, which is the conversion rate of that asset to actual money, which in the advertising world, we measure as cost per impressions or cost per clicks, cost per acquisition. And so if they've got those two pieces of information, they can tell a very cohesive business model story. And that's the kind of metrics that we need to get to. So for every, every business model out there, there aren't hundreds of numbers. There typically is one or maybe two numbers, depending on the complexity of the business model, um, that one can use to message stakeholders and one can use to predict that future business model growth. So the lean startup methodology and that really have, you know, kind of grew up in that startup movement and that, but as it's grown and, and more and more people have been exposed to it, we're seeing it move more and more into larger existing companies and that. What are some of the, I guess, differences or, or takeaways that you've seen uh, from startups using this, these techniques to larger organizations? So as one can imagine, the, the, the bigger challenge, of course, is the addition of, of, of specialized roles and people. I sometimes joke that you know, every process works on paper until you add people, and the more people you add, <laughs> the harder it is. But then the other, the other kind of joke that I'll often say is that startups often fail because they fail to find enough customers to talk to. And this, this methodology is all about you know, creating that continuous feedback loop with customers. Big companies often fail because they stop talking to their own customers. And I can't tell you how many workshops I've been with at larger companies where we spend maybe a fourth, maybe half the time at most on the methodology itself. And everyone quickly gets up to speed because it's you know, fairly easy to kind of rationalize that this may be something worth pursuing and, and at least testing. Uh, but we spend the other half of the time trying to figure out how to actually put it into practice. And the big question always is who is, who is allowed to talk to customers or who is going to go do it? Um, right. Because everyone knows they need to do it, but everyone thinks it's the other person's job. So I find that almost is the Achilles heel really everywhere. Even if you go into a startup, a lot of the developers would, you know, if you come from a technical mindset, you would have that reservation, but I find it even compounded in a, in a, in a larger in a larger organization. Oh, I agree. It seems like if you don't get out of the building in a large organization, a lot of times it comes down to blame marketing on the fact they couldn't sell to your building versus we didn't build something that people wanted in the first place. Tell us a little bit more about the uh, Scaling Lean and some of the things that you've learned from your first book to your second book and what a person should uh, take away if they go out and purchase the Scaling Lean book. Yeah, so I would say that um, the audience conversations are different. And what I mean by that is I often describe innovation as really a series of conversations. So it's the conversation with the entrepreneur or the innovator with their ecosystem of customers, advisors, investors, even competitors. And it's just those different conversations. So the Running Link book, book was mostly focused on the entrepreneur to customer conversation. In other words, how can we talk to customers in a way to understand what we need to build without simply asking them. That's kind of the tricky part. If you ask a customer, what do you want to paraphrase Steve Jobs, they will, they they will, they won't know. They won't, they won't be able to tell you because they often don't know what they want themselves. Um, So that's what the first book was about is how can we use a series of observation and interview techniques to really understand what they're trying to achieve and what they might be struggling with. And then it's really our job to design those solutions that fit into their worldview and kind of build them, and you know, so that's what the first book was about. Uh, the second book, though, was more is more focused on the conversation between that entrepreneur or innovator and their stakeholders. So, as we've kind of described in in the earlier part of the interview, when you come back with the beginnings of a business model story, when you come back with some early learnings, how can you 
pitch a roadmap to a stakeholder where they can see where you're going from a business model sense, um, and you can actually talk numbers. And so that, in many ways, is what that book is focused in on. So it starts off by you know where the first one left is you've got maybe a lean canvas, you've got some early validation, and it walks you through some estimation exercises for testing the business model. Um, I describe a Fermi estimation technique, which is uh, which, if you've ever tried to estimate uh, the number of jelly beans in a jar, that's a very simple example of Fermi estimation. Uh, we can use that same kind of thinking, uh, assumptions thinking and estimation to business modeling. And so that's a quick way to get a ballpark on is this business model worth pursuing? And then the book kind of walks into some of the key metrics. So we talk about the traction metric a, a little bit. Uh, we get into the inputs of traction. So there are three to five metrics that one should always measure. And if you can if you can build a dashboard around that, that gives you a lot of directional compass. So the traction metric might tell you how far you've gone, how much you've got left to go. Uh, but the inputs to that metric are the compass that guide you along the way. And uh, the rest of the book goes into uh, what I call the lean sprint, which is essentially... A like an agile sprint, like a design sprint. It's a way of bringing in team members and practicing a lot of the lean thinking, the lean experiment design and the metrics kind of process in a team setting where you can actually drive results in a in in, in iterations and certain time boxes. Um, so that may be something of interest uh, to some of the listeners out there. Excellent. Well, Ash, thank you very much for being on Inside Outside Innovation. If they, uh, if anybody in the audience wants to reach out to you or find out more about your books and, and how uh, other teachings and such, what's the best way to do so? Uh, everything I do is at leanstack.com. Um, so that's where I would point you to. That's where all my writings are um, and links to our online products and other, other things and a lot, lot of free resources as well out there. Well, I highly recommend everything uh, that you've written. So I appreciate you being on our show. And uh, let's keep in touch, and we'll, uh, we'll bring you back when, if you've got the, the third book out. We're looking for that uh, in the future as well. Thank you, Brian. Great. Thanks, Ash. Talk to you later. That wraps up another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. Thank you to Ash for making this episode possible. Follow our Twitter account, The IO Summit, to get updates on the conference in June. In the meantime, we know you've got opinions that you're dying to share, so leave your opinion of us on iTunes. The world of innovation is always changing, and we want to talk about what you need to hear. So if you've got questions about something in particular, let us know, and we'll answer them on the show. Until next time, go out and innovate, or go to theiosummit.com and secure your ticket for the Inside Outside Innovation Summit. 